Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During today's Q&A session, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat or Q&A function via WebEx. Today's call is also being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn today's meeting over to your host, Ms. Laura Serio. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, Cedric. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second event of the Native American Heritage Month celebration. My name is Laura Soria, and I am the Special Emphasis Program Manager for the Native American Heritage Month, and I'm happy you're here today and able to join us. Before we get started, just a couple of things. If you need closed captions, you can look at your chat function on the right hand of your screen, and you'll be able to click on the link to access the chat. Also make sure, if you're here, you already did it, but make sure that you call in and also use the WebEx function for full audio and visual experience. As I said, my name is Laura Soria. I work in the Office of the Civil Rights Policy and Evaluation Division. And I am excited that you are here with us today. Um, what the theme today is honoring the past and securing the future. And the thought process behind today's event is to have your own colleagues and coworkers share their experiences, share their tribe information, um, share their alliance with tribes in their own words, with their own presentations. Uh, part of our mission and vision is to remain inclusive and I truly hope you enjoy this event today. Our first speaker that we have is Mr. John Cachanego from NOAA. And John, if you give me one second, I will give you control. Okay, John, the floor is all yours. Um, how do I get to the beginning of this presentation again? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, if you hover over your screen to the left, mm -hmm. there's a bar there and you should see the zero one and you'll be able to control it from there. Okay. My apologies, I don't seem to be have anything loaded up. Okay. Um I wonder if it's a connection because I can see the presentation on your screen. Do you see the presentation? I do not. But that 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 makes sense. I'm 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 from a the computer I'm using does not have a camera or we have some connectivity okay. issues. So okay, just, if you I'll just speak. If you, <laughs> okay, if you'd like, just go ahead and say when you're ready. Oh, just let is. me know next slide, and I can definitely do that for you. All right. Well, it, it finally popped up, so it's definitely a lag. But hello, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, John Tichinago. I am a NOAA core officer. Um, my current, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, my heritage itself is Menominee Ojibwe and um, Mohican. I actually grew up on the Menominee Indian Reservation in uh, Wisconsin, just north of Shawano and Green Bay, if anyone's familiar with that area. And I have relatives up in Minnesota on the Ojibwe side as well, um, visit them occasionally. Uh, my current uh, job title and uh, bureau and everything, I'm, so I'm with NOAA I'm under the OMAO, which is the line office for the Office of Marine Aviation Operations. So I drive NOAA ships. My current job is in, as an operations officer for NOAA ship Henry Bigelow. So in addition to my normal shipboard duties, of like ensuring safe and efficient shipboard operations and sending a navigational watch and whatnot, um, an operations officer kind of serves as the vessel's principal project officer for um, various scientific projects on board and interfaces with various scientists um, through different other line offices or other agencies. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So the uh, experience I'm sharing today is um, my experience building a traditional Ojibwe canoe. Um, it's one that I'm probably the most fondest one I've done. I've only done it once, but I've you know I've built many of things in growing up and from my own bustle several times and everything. But 
the canoe was, uh, I think, a highlight. It definitely was the longest. It took about three weeks um, to do. I helped. I was participating hands-on primarily for about two and a half weeks of that. I had the opportunity to work um, with an Ojibwe elder up in Minnesota, who my family that had met has met over the years, and um, he invited me to participate in this uh, process with him. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have many pictures, um, but I. I I, the few that I have hopefully will speak um, some volume to it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, for that first week that I said, that, or half week that I wasn't there, Mr. Skye had laid like the frame um, of the of it already and had most of the materials already gathered. When I finally got, I was able to show up, I helped get uh, the remaining materials, including um, uh, more birch bark for the uh, panels of it, but he already had the cedar ribs um, shaped, not necessarily all placed, as well as the frame already had built. And then we had to get um, spruce roots for sewing it. Uh, so this is image here of um, the day that we're finally placing the ribs within inside the frame. Uh, next slide. And uh, all the panels themselves of the birch park, they were cut very meticulously, and I, again, I wish I had more pictures of it, but um, as, as large as you can off of a tree, carefully peeled away, and then cut into, try to get about two foot sections. Uh, so you have nice big squares to work with, and then tried to have at least like a 20% overlap um, for each panel, and then used spruce root to kind of sew it together. Um, the root itself, that was probably one of the materials that was uh, most difficult, I thought, to go gather because it required quite a bit. And then you had to actually split the root um, with a blade to peel it apart. You actually had, like, you know, root strings to sew with. And if you mess that up, you'd have to go start over again and grab another one and recut it carefully so you actually had the proper length and thickness that needed. Um, there was no needle for doing it. so. And this had a sharpened, uh, actually I had a sharpened porcupine quill as a cheater to like poke through a nice clean hole and then put the roots right through. Um, go ahead and do the next slide. Uh, the pull process, like I said, took about three weeks. Um, when it was done, we had um, uh, added uh, tree sap to kind of like fill in along the seams and whatnot which uh, worked pretty well, but we, the time of the year that we were doing it didn't have enough. So uh, Mr. Sky cheated a little bit with uh, tar on the back end of it to make up for the limiting material we did not have. But um, it's six, I was able to successfully test uh, the canoe in um, a nearby uh, pond near his home. And uh, with no, no leaks, and it was uh, definitely uh, seaworthy, so to speak. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had more at the time. I wish this was like in the early 2000s, and I remember like I wish I had a camcorder to take more videos and such of this, but I didn't have it, didn't have it at the time. But um, from what little photos that I have, which are these, I'm glad I have them. It's something I wish I could go back and do again. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, so I uh, cannot. But if I ever had the opportunity to do so again, I definitely would, and I'd want to have my children to uh, do it as well. But I think it was probably the, one of the few um, major like milestones I remember growing up of building something that helped connect me to my heritage, particularly the maritime heritage. So, yeah, that's it. Next slide. Thank you. Hi, Don. This is Laura. I know you have to, to log off, and I want to thank you for, for sharing the canoe making experience for you. Now, I just I want to ask you a quick question before you go. Uh, for all the listeners, we have Q&A session at the end, but John has to, um, he's on the ship, so he has to log off. Uh, John, what happens to, to the canoe? Do you get to keep it, or? So that particular canoe actually ended up going on display at um, the tribal uh, like visitor center um, for Mr. Sky's um, 
uh, uh, reservation was. I don't remember the name of that one. Oh gosh, that site's terrible because like, I have family up there too. Uh, it's up in northern Minnesota, just north of Superior. Um, but it was there for a while, and I'm not sure what happened after it. I wanted to keep it, mm -hmm. and uh, I asked if I could come back and get it, um, but it just uh, did not uh, did not work out. So, if I ever had the opportunity to make one again, I would be I would for sure uh, keep that one, or um, yeah, make them continuously. It was a lot. Of, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I was skeptical when first building it. But uh, yeah, what do you know? Like you know, my ancestors knew what they were doing. <laughs> it worked out just fine. Yeah. It, well, thank you for for sharing. That's really wonderful. And hopefully, if you build another one, you have the skills now. You'll share that with us. Thank you for having me. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you, John. Thank you. And now we are going to move to our second presenter, Ms. Teresa Boykin from NOAA. If you give me one second, let me upload your presentation. Okay. Thank you. And then, Teresa, let me know when you can see your presentation on screen and should be able to, to move through it. I can see it now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Teresa Boykin, and I'm a primary chemical patent examiner at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I examine chemical inventions in the polymer chemistry and technology area. I'm also a member of the Nanticoke Tribe of Delaware and of the Turtle Clan. I'm presenting today because I, I wanted to, sh to bring more awareness about the tribes along the eastern coastland. History often depicts remaining Native Americans as those residing only in the western and plain states. However, there are still Native Americans along the eastern shores of America. One of those tribes is the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape tribe of Delaware. The Nanticoke Lenni Lenape were one of the original inhabitants of the Delmarva Peninsula who, after splitting away from their larger Lenny Lenape tribe, arrived in their homeland, Delaware, around 10,000 years ago, speaking the original Algonquian language. Like most indigenous people along the eastern shores, the Nanticoke focused on hunting, farming, and fishing. Each member was knowledgeable about using plants as medicine, and they recognized the synergistic effect of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. The Nanticoke lived along what is still called today the Indian River in Delaware, between the areas of Rehoboth, Millsboro, and Indian River 100 until the Indian Removal Act. However, on March 10, 1881, the incorporated body of the Nanticoke Indian Association was recognized by the state of Delaware. With this state recognition, the Nanticoke gained the right to practice their customs and build their own schools for Nanticoke children. However, during and before the time of the forced migration, although many migrated elsewhere, others remained in Delaware by hiding in plain sight through mingling among and marrying local people, both black and white. During the early 1900s, other Nanticoke returned from Oklahoma and other places seeking to reclaim or buy back their property. Here are some of my relatives who returned and who hid in plain sight during that time. In order to celebrate this, each year the Nanticoke tribe has an annual powwow in September on the very land they resided on centuries before. The noun powwow from the Narragansett Eastern Algonquian language is a cultural event that features group singing and dancing by men, women, and children. Through these gatherings, cultural traditions are passed down from generation to generation. Each powwow begins with a grand entry or procession of dancers serving as the bringing together of tribes. They are guided by two lead dancers, a male and a female, who follow the presentation of flags, the United States flag, the Delaware flag, and the Nanticoke flag. 
after the grand entry, dancers enter the dance circle by age and style of regalia. The Nanticoke tribe was and still is a matrilineal society, meaning clans are passed down through the mother's bloodline. Although my grandfather was of the wolf clan, I am of the turtle clan, as was my grandmother. Women also had an equal status, and so it is not unusual for a woman to hold a high position in the tribe. In slides 14 through 18, here are more recent pictures of my relatives at a recent powwow. The eagle feather is held highly in most native cultures, and typically eagle feathers are earned through good deeds and should not, be touch, should not touch the ground. This is because the eagle is believed to be closer to the great creator. Only a few members have eagle feathers. One of the most touching moments for me personally is when members of the military are asked to join in the dance circle. We believe that the military is a continuation of the native warriors who protect and serve this country. Each branch of the United States military is very highly regarded. This coming year, in September 2021, my son will be joining the dancers in the powwow, performing the dance referred to as men's traditional. He has spent much of his quarantine time making, designing, beading, and sewing his regalia, including his moccasins and breastplates. I would like to invite all of you today to attend the next year's powwow, which will be held in September in Millsboro, Delaware. You can find out more on the NanticokeIndians.org website as it becomes available. Thank you. Thank you, Sedeta. This is Laura again. Thank you so much for, for sharing your presentation. and. Um, as we discussed earlier, if you could hang out until the Q&A uh, session later today, I know I have some questions for you, and I'm sure our audience will as well. Thank you very much. Okay, now we are going to move on to our next presenter, and that's Tracy Bosey from NOAA. And Tracy, give me one second while I get your presentation connected here. And let me know when you're able to see the presentation and present. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Tracy. Are you able to see your presentation and move through yes, it? Yes, I am. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tracy Bose. In Cricket, my grandfather had named me Kashlu. It was after his middle daughter. Uh, I am an investigative support technician at NOAA's National Marines Fishery Service West Coast Division in the Office of Law Enforcement. My position is assisting our special agents and enforcement officers, as well as uh, joining forces with um, local state partners, and monitoring the fishing activities along the West Coast region. My position, also I have um, a co-chair for the American Indian Alaska Native Employee Resource Group. We are actually new. This, this coming December is our first year. Uh, we've got a handful of people across NOAA and, and are just getting started right now, learning how we can be a resource for our fellow Native American and Alaska, American Indian and Alaska Native employees here in NOAA. On the main slide here, I wanted to share a first picture of myself, but back in middle school, I don't know how many of you may have actually experienced this, but we had something called a culture fair, and I couldn't wait. I'd heard about the culture fair a few years before finally getting to middle school, and during that time, you were set up a presentation in the gymnasium, 
and everybody had their storyboards and was sharing their culture. And for me, I'm a proud Alaska Native. I'm a Clinket from Southeast. Um, and then what I was able to wear that day was my grandfather's storytelling regalia. On here, if you can see the beadwork, this is called a seasoned storytelling regalia. The different colors are the leaves sewn with the seed beads, showing the transition of the, of the leaves throughout the year. As said before, my tribal affiliation, I'm a citizen of the Central Council of the Klingon and Haida tribes and the Sitka tribe of Alaska. My family is from both Cape Alaska and Sitka on Bernoff Island. Specifically under the tribal names, I'm Klingit. I'm from the Raven Moiti in the Kuksadi, which is the frog clan house. Uh, many people may not know what a Moiti is. This specifically is showing the society is divided into two equal parts. For the Klingit is eagle and raven. Eagle is actually split between two heads of house, either eagle or wolf. The Klingit culture is based on a matrilineal structure. Uh, actually, as you may have heard earlier, uh, what this means is and similarly to what we follow with our names in modern times with your last name following your husband and your children then following that name. It's following the woman. And me, I follow my mother who follows her mother, who are frogs under the raven moiti. Back then, that really meant that you could only marry the opposite in moiti tradition. Uh, that actually, that structure broke down about 100 years ago. Uh, my grandparents actually were one of the last few traditionals. There might be only handfuls now. Both of them are Clinket. My grandmother, the raven, and my grandfather, the eagle. Here in this picture, you see me with my mother and my grandmother. Alongside, as I progress through here, I'm going to be showing you some other artwork here. But if you see, the vest that I'm wearing is with the button blanket style with the shell beads. And then there's beadwork on here that my grandmother had done. And then the carvings that my grandfather had made. The creativity and art in our culture is incredibly important. Uh, my grand my grandmother, she kept the heritage alive using her beadwork and the, the designs that she'd made with the seed beads. A lot of times you will see like in the main page, and here I have a few pictures where my grandfather is wearing, this one is also a seasoned leaf vest. You can see there's a pendant that he is wearing around his neck. It's an eagle with the wings of the American flag and then the rose. She was well known for her beadwork. Uh, she only taught a few people who had the time and patience because you really had to take your time with beading. My mother, she used her skills with sewing and she made the vest. So the vests that are in these photos as well as that one with my family, which I don't know if you can see here, but I still kept this one from when I was a little girl. A simple one. But on the very back is a frog representing our clan house. And then on this third picture, it's a button blanket style design, frog button blanket robe that I had made with my niece for a school presentation on Clinket Native culture. And then just trying to branch out on the variety of, of art. Uh, working with my sister and took this photo of her this year. We're trying to bring awareness to the MMIW, which stands for the Murdered, Missing, and Indigenous Women. Uh, this is something that she wanted to do to represent the loss of various women and daughters, sisters, aunties throughout North America as well as in Canada. Um, painting with acrylic and pastel was something I'd done at a young age. I haven't actually picked up 
a brush in a number of years. After my grandfather's passing, you you're supposed to hold on to some of your work and not to do anything in honor and respect. What I picked up after that was actually sewing and doing photography. Here is a photo of Chief Kasa Ish of the Chukaniti clan. It's a porpoise clan house. This is my grandfather. He's the Eagle Moati. Being the chief, children descendants and their descendants are royal. He was a woodcarver, a storyteller, and a dancer. On the bottom right hand photograph, I found this online in one of the archives. And what I really loved about this one is the center photo. The center of the photo is my grandfather and the regalia that he's wearing. He's got bear ears, which we were we kept within our family. I'm hoping you can see this. They're decorated with shells and beads. This here, that photo is taken at a cake. This cake is a city in southeast Alaska, the potlatch the totem raising in 1971. He was a second generation with carver and teacher. He and his father, Peter C. Nelson, they were commissioned to carve plaques that were on display at the Northwest Coast Indian Art Exhibit at the 1962 World's Fair in Seattle. My brother, Travis Wood, is the latest to learn the wood carving and has taken up with the tradition. Many of the examples that we have that were completed were actually works that my grandfather had started. And the pictures displayed here, this middle picture, you can see a lot of the little totem poles and plaques. Those are the style of work that he had done. It had been a number of years since he's made larger plaques. Uh, I was not even born yet when he had worked on a totem pole that was really, really tall. If you're able to see it, I did bring a few things uh, similar to what was in the photo. I have a totem pole. This is a Thunderbird that my grandfather had started and my brother had finished after his passing. And there are many, because he was a teacher, he had many works started so that as he was sharing his craft and wanting to teach others to keep that tradition alive, we have several works that have been passed through the family who's learning carving to be able to carry on that tradition and have that line tied directly with him as their teacher. And then this here, I have a wolf mask. This is made out of red cedar. Actually quite heavy. Anytime I've ever seen the masks used uh, in dance, they're, they have them secured so that they aren't staying in place. This one is more for display. And then like the description, I have a plaque. This one here is the eagle alongside that is the raven. I have these as a gift from my brother, Travis. When we got married, my grandfather had started him and my brother had finished it. So even after my grandfather's passing, I still was honored with work that he had, had started. And finally, this last image this is something when I was doing some research on our family, I was so excited to find this little tidbit of information. This here is an image of an eagle figure. This was carved by my great grandfather, Peter C. Nielsen, and is actually located in the National Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian. It's a great honor to know that something in my family has been treasured and cherished in this museum and for future generations to see. I appreciate your time and listening to a little bit of story about the art and culture. So let's teach. Hi, Tracy. This is Laura. Thank you so much for sharing. I would love to take a, a tour of your house and see everything. 
up front and in person. Thank you so much for sharing. And again, please stay around for a Q&A session at the end. And now we're going to move on to our next presenter, Ms. Miranda Meyer from NOAA. Miranda, give me one second. Let me give you control and pull up your presentation. And just let me know when you see it and you're ready to, to proceed. Miranda? Yep, I'm here. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yep. Um, hi everyone, my name is Miranda Meyer. I've been working in the Acquisition and Grants Office of NOAA cumulatively for about three years now as a contract specialist. I've been a civilian employee for about five years now and um, I've also worked at NASA and for the Department of Defense for a short time and then I also served on active duty in the United States Army for four years. Aside from my professional background, I would like to tell everyone about my cultural background and where I came from. Chio, Nagada, Miranda Meyer, Dagodoa, Dikilinka, Sanudiska, Salagi, Aniwia, Tequila. Hi everyone, my name is Miranda Meyer. I'm an enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I was born and raised on the Koala Boundary, located in Western North Carolina. Um, the image to the left is of the Great Smoky Mountains. The koala boundary is nestled in at the center of the mountains. Uh, you'll also notice the wooden sign depicting the seal of our tribe. I chose to include that image for a couple of reasons. Um, at the center, you'll see that there is a seven-pointed star. Uh, the number seven is very important to my tribe. You'll also notice that my tribe is called the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. We are a sovereign nation, meaning we have our own laws, elections, government, and institutions. My tribe is one of three federally recognized tribes of Cherokee. Additionally, on the sign at the bottom, you'll see that there are seven non-English characters at the bottom. This is our alphabet, or sometimes called syllabary. A unique aspect of the Cherokee as a whole is that we are historically matrilineal. Women were considered the head of the household with the home and children belonging to her. The seven clans are a traditional social organization of Cherokee society. Clanship is passed from the mother. People are not allowed to marry within their own clan. And during community events, most clans would sit together as this was also an extension of their own family. If a woman chose to separate from her husband, then everything remained in her possession and the man would return to his clan. Women were also given a voice in council meetings, partaking in all major decisions made. In the spring and summer months, the women primarily farmed to support their families while also making pottery and baskets. Um, a, notice, a notable basket made by the Cherokee is the River Cane basket, which is the one in the center. Um, this basket was crafted from a material called River Cane, which is a member of the bamboo family. Um, it was double woven so tight that it was able to carry water. In the year 1821, a man named Sequoia invented the Cherokee alphabet. He made symbols for every sound in our language, totaling 85 characters to make up the syllabary. Although the Cherokee nation had made efforts to assimilate and accommodate to the English colonies, many acts and policies were executed in an effort to ensure the diminishment of the Cherokee people would take place. In 1838, the efforts for removal culminated in the tragic Trail of Tears. Of the 16,000 members of the Cherokee Nation forced west, approximately 4,000 died from starvation, disease, exposure, the exhausted march, and also the, sh the shock of exile. This map shows the area of land where the Cherokee Nation originally lived, with many small towns and communities spread throughout. The Cherokee Nation was a superpower. As the Eastern Band of Cherokee, we are the descendants of Trail of Tears survivors, some of who made it to Oklahoma and then walked back. Others are descended from Cherokee who managed to keep land they owned and did not march. We are also descendants of those who hid in the mountains and refused to be relocated. In 1850, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians numbered 1,000 members. As of today, there are approximately 15,986 enrolled members. 
Indian boarding schools for Native American children were operational between the years of 1879, with the last of them closing in the 1950s. The goal was forced assimilation of Native children into a traditional American society. The students at the boarding schools were forbidden to express their culture, everything from wearing long hair to speaking their native language. The photo to the right is from the Carlisle Indian Barracks, which operated from 1879 to 1918. And the photo on the left is from the Chimawa Indian School that operated in Oregon. And then back forward to today, Che Ocheto, we're still here. The woman in the center of the photo is my grandmother. She's a full-blooded Eastern Cherokee woman and a survivor of an Indian boarding school. The Koala Boundary now serves as a major tourist destination. Today, we have an amazing education and training program, which provides funds, training, health opportunities, and so much more to our people. Thanks to this program, I was able to attain both my bachelor's and master's degrees virtually for free. In a major effort to revitalize our language, the new Ketua Academy was opened to teach young children ages ranging from 1 to 12 exclusively in the Cherokee language. Additionally, we own and operate two casinos and continue to expand our business portfolio as evidenced by recent headlines showcasing the tribe's continued financial independence. I hope you enjoy hearing about my tribe's history and I am proud to be able to share it with everyone today. There is no word in the Cherokee language for goodbye. We simply say, Dana Dagahoyu, until we meet again. Shiki, and thank you. Thank you, Miranda. This is Laura. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for presenting today, for putting all this together, and you did an incredible job. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to move to our next presenter, uh, Ms. Rhonda Dorsey from OIG. Rhonda, give me one second while I give you control and up your, upload your slides. Okay, and, how's the audio? Yes, it's great. Yes. Can you see your presentation on the screen? Not yet. I still see Miranda's last slide from her presentation, okay. but I may have a slow connection here. There's a there's a slight delay. Just let me know when you're ready and you should be able to uh, transition through your slides. Okay. Okay, I see your slides are up on my screen. Are you able to see them? Mine is still showing Miranda's last slide. Okay. All right, give me one second. Okay, let me... Okay. There we go. Yep, it's changed. Thank you. You're Appreciate welcome. that. And let me know if you're yeah. able to scroll down the screen because I have, I see that I'm the host. If you're not able to scroll, just let me know and I can scroll for you. Yeah, it looks like the functionality is good on this side. Thanks. But All right, greetings, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. And a big thanks to Laura for the opportunity to share. I'm Rhonda Dorsey, a writer editor for the Office of Inspector General, fairly new employee for OIG. So wanted to talk about uh, my time as a teacher uh, with the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, about 15 years ago, um, I accepted a position serving the Oglala Lakota Nation as a secondary English teacher with the Bureau of Indian Education under the U.S. Department of the Interior. All right, the slide flipped. Uh, Pine Ridge School, located in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, is a boarding school that educates around 1,000 students every year. Um, although I had a familial in-law tie to the Rosebud Nation, 
and I had only lived about an hour from Pine Ridge the previous two years um, as a fairly new resident of South Dakota, I knew very little about Indigenous culture outside of the mandatory three-credit South Dakota Indian Studies class that was required uh, to get certified to be a teacher. So during my interview with the principal, uh, we engaged in a walkabout through the school. And as we neared the gym, we passed a multitude of trophy cases full of awards for the Pine Ridge Thorps. And every sport was showcased from the basketball, wrestling, baseball, to cross country, volleyball, and even track and field. I demonstrated how little I had prepared for my interview when I blurted aloud, what's a Thorpe? And the principal laughed and I recognized immediately, um, like I would for many times in my tenure with Pine Ridge, that my West teacher ignorance was totally obvious. The principal was so forgiving and explained that the school's mascot was named in honor of Jim Thorpe, an Oklahoma-born legendary native athlete who won gold medals in the decathlon and pentathlon at the 1912 Olympics. And also at this time, the King of Sweden called Thorpe um, he said, you, sir, are the greatest athlete in the world. And I had had no idea. So during my tenure at Pine Ridge, it became clear to me that my personal knowledge about indigenous culture was severely lacking and wholly misinformed. And as I worked with my students in teaching them about Beowulf and five paragraph essay development, they in turn helped me in developing a cultural awareness and also in learning how to challenge status quo. Being asked to participate in the sacred ceremonies of buffalo kill, sweat, wiping of tears, sun dance, and powwow taught me so much more about life, so much more enriching, more so than I ever taught my students. And I count my time of federal service at Pine Ridge as being the most significant in helping me carve a path for advocacy, and I'm forever grateful. Kalamia, go Thorpe. Hi, Rhonda, did we, did we lose sound or connection here? Um, I'm, I thought I finished my presentation. <laughs> but oh, maybe okay. no one heard anything I said. <laughs> I don't thank know. you. Thank you. I didn't hear a sound for a second there. It might have just been my phone. Thank you, Rhonda. I appreciate you reaching out. I know when we first uh, started to talk about your presentation, um, you were really excited, new to Department of Commerce, and welcome, and thank you again for participating today. Um, now we're going to go ahead and move to our last presenter, Beth Reg from NOAA. Beth, I'm going to go ahead and give you control. Uh, just let me know once you have your presentation and if you are able to scroll through it. Still on the previous one. Okay. Sorry, there seems to be a little bit of a of a delay there. Cedric, can you help? Sure. Thank you everybody for your patience. As we all know, technology isn't always our friend when we are working on it. Second. Two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're waiting for that. I can do my introduction quickly. Anine Minoa Bujou or greetings and salutations. My name's Beth Reggie. I'm out of NOAA Southeast Fisheries Science Center. And today I'm gonna to tell you what I do at NOAA, my tribal affiliations, very good, and the traditional skills that I teach. Let's see if I can advance this. There we go. 
Uh, my favorite fish is the sturgeon. However, I'm happy to talk to salmon or anybody else that's a funded project. Southeast Fisheries Science Center, the F inside this is for fish. And that's one of the main reasons I came to NOAA. It was all about the fish. Fish that I have known while working for NOAA and before I got here are sturgeon, trout, walleye, bass, cod, loggerheads, and salmon. And these fishes, we have weighed them and tracked them and monitored them and try to figure out spatially and temporally where they were going and what they were doing. And I followed these fishes to California, the Carolinas, Iceland, Wisconsin, New Zealand, Florida, go Tigers, and the Great Barrier Reef. So there's wonderful fishes out there, and there's a lot of great science that could be done following them. But currently what I'm doing is I'm working with stock assessments. One of the ones that's up on the deck right now is SCAMP, and basically I follow fish around just to make maps of them. So we use statistical analysis to get spatial uh, locations on where the fish are and what they're doing, what's their movement. Because fish science is all about the numbers, and some of those numbers are hard fought for, especially when you're sitting down in the hole freezing in Iceland. But what I want to talk to you today about is my tribal affiliation. I am Anishinaabe, I am Bad River Chippewa, and I am Crane Clan. Happy to say I am reservation born and raised, Ban River, Meshka Zibi. The Zibi is river and Meshka is marsh, like the Kakagan flu. And our tribe is right here, but all of these are affiliated. So I was born here, I was raised here, I grew up here. And the bad in Bad River refers to the flow of the water. If you take a look here at the Flowage, if you're in a canoe, that's pretty bad. That's pretty treacherous. But Copper Falls State Park is about, eh, on snowmobile, about 15 minutes from my house. And this is what you get to when you get there. I'm not going to try it with a canoe. And the young people at home are still very engaged culturally, and it's great to see. This is grand entry at our powwow in 2019. Sad to say that this year is the first year I haven't got home. But tradition is strong there. And teaching is the bridge between traditional and contemporary. And I enjoy teaching traditional means. So I teach traditional skills with other artisans every summer. My specialty is bead weaving and quill work. And it's based on traditional values with contemporary material and applications. Um, this particular one is at the Smithsonian. That's one of the things I do in class. And we teach the different types of peyote stitches and gourd stitches. But the Mashkazibi, the Bad River, among the courses that we teach in traditional ways in the summer is we have t hide tanning and fire making and beadwork and carding and basket making and birch bark and storytelling, there's just a wonderful plethora of teaching that occurs every year at home. I specifically am a bead weaver and an instructor, and there's no greater joy than when somebody makes something and you pass on how to do this, and they walk away with their porcupine quills in their hands, and they can then go back and teach others how to do this, and it's really quite enjoyable. I also have mesh gazebe designs, and these are some of the things I make. This, port, this Thunderbird here was specifically made for Joe Rose. We found an old one that had been made for them. And I've taken the new materials and the new beads and the new seeds and taken the quill patterns and transferred those over into beads. Um, we carve pipes down and make little bags for them. and the. Um, this particular blue earring here, this peyote stitch is called baby food earrings. And the reason is because a woman could make those earrings and then go sell them for baby food. So the baby food earrings is one of my favorite patterns. 
this is the, the traditional gourd stitch on a pen that you can clip and take with you. Um, and then the bigger works, of course, fishes I have known and loved. And now I think I'll just get in my canoe. We made this one in, I think, 2017. About every three years we take on the um, effort of making a canoe. When we can find the birch trees, there's really hard time now finding trees with sufficient girth like we had for this one. Some of the birch for this particular tree came off my land. Thank you very much for listening today. I appreciate all your time. Have a great day. Beth, thank you. This is Laura. Looks like maybe you and John may need to connect on, on making a canoe together. He's welcome to come play with us. <laughs> thank you. I would love to. And thank you for everybody who is an attendee. Now we are going to open up the chat function or Q&A for questions. If you have any or any comments, please go ahead and type them in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I will read a question that I had sent to, to me individually, and this is for everybody. The question is, and feel free to answer, um, you know, just go ahead and answer at any time. How can we, as your colleagues, learn more about your Native American cultures and make you feel more included at work? So anybody who would like to tackle that question, please just go ahead and speak freely. Hey, Laura, this is Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm going to share my, my opinion on this. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is sometimes people are are not sure what to say or how to to ask questions. And I think the best thing for any inclusiveness is just to ask, "What are your thoughts? How?" And and just like they are asking us now, it's not being afraid to ask and to be direct. Uh, there's no wrong way to ask a question uh, because. Like what I've seen with many of the presentations is we were happy to share our history and our culture and having the question alone speaks volumes on the inclusive. Thank you, Tracy. I do have a similar question here. Um, Elizabeth asked, how can we support you outside of work? How can we be advocates, allies for uh, Native American people. One of the things I would recommend is you could learn about ACES, American Indian Science and Engineering Society. That's where I do a lot of my outreach work. That's where you can do a lot of interactions. That's where you can learn that we need judges for science fairs. I'm a lifetime member of Sequoia. I'm an elders for their group. And ACES is a great place to start. Come on down and visit. Wonderful, thank you. And I am seeing a lot of comments in the chat. Um, thank you, thanking all of you for your presentations today. Um, the artwork, the everything, everyone seems to be very, very pleased. And I do have some comments too about things that everybody learned. Um, awesome presentation, thank you. This was wonderful. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for sharing your stories and cultures today. I learned so much. Uh, Beth, thank you for talking to us about your tribal affiliation and its connection to your career choice and your artistry. Uh, we only have about uh, three or four minutes left. I just want to take that time to thank you all, John, Teresa, Tracy, Miranda, Rhonda, and Beth. Thank you so much. Working with you was a pleasure uh, viewing your presentations, learning about you individually was an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you so much. If you could stay on the line, uh, we're going to have it just a tiny debrief amongst all of us. And to everybody who joined us today, thank you. I know Monday mornings 
are are a little bit tough and schedules are busy, but thank you very much. We truly appreciate your participation today. Miigwech. Thank you, and that concludes today's conference. You may all disconnect at this time. <laughs>